Thank you, Mr. President. It is an honor to be speaking in this chamber tonight. It is an important thing to be able to hold an institution or a government accountable for its wrongdoings. It is especially important to do this in the context of tonight's debate. The West has a long history of profiting from the struggles of people in less developed countries, the consequences of centuries of colonization still being experienced in the lives of many today. Ladies and gentlemen, as I speak against the motion today, I do not deny this history. I do not deny the scars that it has left. Instead, I hope to show you that it cannot be forced under the label of Western lending to explain the plight of developing countries today. I also do not deny the disadvantages that Western lending can create for de developing countries. However, I will show why this is not the same as being blameworthy for their plight as a whole. The heart of my argument tonight lies in the oversimplification of the issues present in today's motion. On this basis, I'll make two main points. I will first explain how Western lenders specifically is not representative of the na true nature of lending, and instead how this emphasis on the West feeds into the very colonialist ideas that the proposition is so strongly trying to warn against in the first place. Secondly, I will consider the notion of blame, and specifically the role of causation within this. Whilst I will, will leave the intricacies of economics to our guest speakers, I am no expert, I urge you to appreciate how lending alone cannot possibly be used to explain the entirety of the plight of developing countries, even where we operate on the assumption that lending disadvantages the debtor country. But before I continue, it falls upon me to introduce the propos proposition speakers of tonight's debate. Our first speaker, who you've just heard from, Armand Noaz, is a philosophy and theology student at Lady Margaret Hall and our very own union president. Ahmad is an inspiring activist, boasting 264,000 followers on Instagram. <laughs> Yet, despite this, he couldn't get a single one of us to follow his argument tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All jokes aside, Ahmad, I have really enjoyed working on committee um, this term and look forward to the rest of the term. And thank you for the opportunity to speak here tonight. Our second speaker is His Excellency Eduardo Enrique Reina. I'm not going to lie, I was going to find it very hard to roast you tonight, considering that you came all the way from Honduras. So I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Later, we will hear from Mr. Kunal Sen, economist, author, and professor of development economics. Mr. Sen is also director of the United Nations University. Don't worry, I've never heard of it either. <laughs> in fact, when looking at university rankings to see where it placed, I couldn't scroll far enough. Then again, coming from Oxford, I'm not used to having to scroll that far. <laughs> Mr. President, these are your proposition speakers and they are most welcome. <laughs> so the first question we must ask ourselves when discussing the debate motion is who we actually mean when we say Western lenders. Naturally, Western lenders includes the governments and central banks of countries in the West, and it has also been argued that it includes multilateral development banks, such as the IMF and the World Bank, who are seen to be largely controlled by Western powers. But is it really right to say that it is just these Western countries or Western-dominated institutions that are lending money on the types of terms that the pro proposition has so clearly laid out for us? No, it's simply incorrect to stipulate that the institutions and governments with these problem problematic lending schemes are solely Western. A poignant contradiction to this Western assumption is China. China has emerged as one of the global leaders in international development finance and currently stands as a... Yeah. China is recently started from 2013. Less than anything years, I'll I'll finish the point and then if your question still stands. Um, stands as the largest official creditor in the world. So to answer your question, yes, they might not have been lending from us early on. However, they are now the largest creditor in the world. And I think that we need to recognize that in today's debate. Linked to its, um, linked to its Belt and Road strategy, the Chinese government and its state-owned banks have extended their presence on a global scale. However, like Western institutions, they have too been criticized for their execution of these loans. This includes encour encouraging countries to take on more debt than they can handle, and thereby making them dependent on the country, using loans to leverage geopolitical influence in a region, and demanding repayment in a way advantageous to them and not the dependent country. Take Pakistan, for example. The development of CPEC 
the Chinese-Pakistan Economic Corridor means Pakistan has an unsustainable debt burden to China. As it now stands, this debt is at $30 billion. That's just a tenth of its entire gross domestic product. Evidently, the type of lending that can exacerbate a state's debt burden and economic valence is not specific to Western lenders. Even if the nature or the terms of the loans are different, lending of not on, of non-Western countries can, just ease, can be just as easily criticized on the same grounds as those of the West. In fact, the dominance that this motion lends, pun very much intended, I'll just finish the point and then, to Western institutions is ironic, given the broad omission of the proposition to expose lending as a form of neocolonialism. In labeling this motion as Western lenders only, the proposition is perpetuating that very Eurocentric view of the West lending to the rest, rather than recognizing the shift towards non-Western institutions and governments who are exercising the same power as their Western counterparts. So now that we've established that this house cannot blame just Western lenders for the plight of developing countries. However, this only debunks one word of the motion, Western, and not the whole idea of the motion itself. As it stands, this house could still blame lenders for the plight of developing countries. In disproving the rest of the motion tonight, I want to discuss what it actually means to blame someone. To blame means to hold someone responsible, liable, culpable. And how is one responsible or liable for something? Well, since I study law, it would be rude of me not to include something of what I've learned from my degree so far. So let's talk about causation. And it's true, for blame, there must be an element of causation. We blame those who we think have caused something fault-worthy or wrong. Therefore, by blaming lenders for the plight of develop developing countries, the motion is suggesting causation between the loans given from such lenders and the subsequent struggles that these countries face. Now, of course, discussion of causation naturally requires some simplification, but not to the extent that the proposition is suggesting. Whilst we cannot account for every individual factor that results in a certain outcome, outcome we certainly cannot ignore equally as potent factors in dictating a certain result. In law, we call this the novice actor's intervenience, a new intervening act, the point where a new and different event dictates a specified outcome. If we apply this concept to the argument today, I think you will find that the motion skips a lot of these intervening acts, a lot of history, a lot of practice of current governments in these developing states, or at the very least, fails to account for the interaction of these other factors with Western lending. Let's take the example of Sri Lanka, a country currently facing huge economic crisis, which is driving millions of people into poverty. Since its independence, but particularly after its civil war, Sri Lanka has been subject to a litany of poor policy choices, poor economic management, and corruption on behalf of the government. The Rajapaksa government is notorious for lowering taxes for the wealthy, increasing tax holidays for large corporations, using the rhetoric of self-sufficiency to impose major import restrictions. Loans the country has received have been grossly mismanaged, vast amounts being spent on ostentatious infrastructure projects to attract tourism and re reward political cronies, rather than having any national utility. So can we really attribute the plight of Sri Lanka to the fact that it took out loans? No. Whether it be war, the policies of government, corruption, they have all shaped the plight the countries face today. If we cannot establish a clear sense of causation between lending and the, not just a, the plight of developing countries, how can we possibly blame lenders? How can we possibly place blame where we don't know where the responsibility truly lies? Not only does this mask the complexity of the situation if we do, but it is dangerous to only attribute blame to Western lenders and in the process detract responsibility and ownership from the current governments of these countries. Furthermore, I have made it easy for the proposition and I'm operating under the assumption that as the proposition has argued, Western lending definitely has negative consequences. As I said at the beginning, clearly there are exploitative practices involved in lending, and I'm not going to deny this. And yet, the picture of causation that is already so complicated is further muddied if we consider the fact that loans don't necessarily result in hard hardship, but can have positive consequences too. Take the IMF, for example, which I know the proposition spoke so, so strongly about. Regardless, regardless of its repayment terms, structural adjustment policies, the organization provides for countries in times of crisis. In the short term, this can protect the livelihoods of an entire population. 
I think what the proposition is trying to get you to focus on is the deep-rooted impact of colonialism, that is the impact it's had and its impact that it still has on developing countries today. And as I said at the beginning, this cannot be denied. But also, we cannot sho shoehorn this far larger issue into a motion purely about Western lending. I think it wouldn't give justice to the severity and size of that issue by doing that. And therefore, I urge you to vote against this motion tonight. Thank you. <laughs>